Oscar Wilde's present life. On the 13th of November, 1895, I was brought down here from London. From two o'clock till half past two. On that day, I had to stand on the centre platform of Clapham Junction in convict dress. I'm handcuffed for the world to look at. I had been taken out of the hospital ward without a moment's notice being given to me. Of all possible objects, I was the most grotesque. When people saw me, they laughed. Each train as it came up swelled the audience. Nothing could exceed their amusement. That was, of course, before they knew who I was. As soon as they had been informed, they laughed still more. For half an hour, I stood there in the grey November rain, surrounded by a jeering mob, and one of the commuters spat on my face. For a year after that was done to me, I wept every day at the same hour and for the same space of time. To those who are in prison, tears are a part of every day's experience. A day in prison in which one does not weep is a day in which one's heart is hard, not a day on which one's heart is happy. Prison turns a man's heart to stone. I had lost my name, my position, my happiness, my freedom, and my wealth. I was a prisoner and a pauper, but I still had my children left. Suddenly, they were taken away from me by the law. It was a blow so appalling that I did not know what to do. So I flung myself on my knees and I bowed my head and I wept and I said, the body of a child is, that, is as the body of the Lord. I am not worthy of either. That moment seemed to save me. Some six weeks ago, I was allowed by the doctor to have white bread to eat instead of the coarse black or brown bread of ordinary prison fare. It is a great delicacy. It will sound strange that dry bread could possibly, could possibly be a delicacy to anyone. To me, it's so much so that at the close of each meal, I carefully eat whatever crumbs may be left on my tin plate or have fallen on the rough towel that one uses as a cloth so as not to soil one's table. And I do know I do so not from hunger. I get now quite sufficient food, but simply in order that nothing should be wasted of. What is given to me, one should look on love. The one piece of good news that Oscar received whilst in prison was when his beautiful and loyal wife Constance came to visit him in prison. She mentioned to him that the French were performing his play, Salome. Oscar broke down when she told him this. The French were very good to Oscar. Um, and they said to the English, is this how you treat your poets? But of course we all know Oscar was very much an Irishman. In those days, a prisoner who was serving hard labor was allowed visits every three months. Constance Wilde sadly died later in Italy in 1898. She was the daughter of a well-known barrister from Eli Place in Dublin. One instance of Oscar's friendliness occurred when Oscar was in Reading Jail. He was ill in the prison hospital and an appeal for his early release was pending. The Home Office representative visited Oscar to consider his case. Oscar knew of the appeal and although ill was in buoyant spirits at the possibility of an early release, they found him sitting on his bed surrounded by an enthralled and delighted audience of fellow prisoners. The Home Office representative had expected to find a very different person to the gay, sparkling conversationist they had seen. In consequence, the appeal failed. When Asper heard the result of the appeal, he suffered a relapse, and had the official seen him, they might have reported differently. Oscar's mother had died, died whilst he was still in prison. On the night of her death, he claimed she appeared to him in his cell. She was dressed for out of doors, and he'd asked her to take off her, pack, her hat and cloak and to sit down, but she shook her head sadly and vanished. When the prison warden Martin came to tell 
tell him of her death, he said quietly, I know it already. His prison war order Martin was very kind to Oscar Wilde. When Oscar was brought out of prison for the bankruptcy court, his devoted friend Robbie Ross described him as such. Physically, he is much worse than anyone had led me to believe. Indeed, I should not have known him at all. His clothes hung about him in loose folds, and his hands are like those of a skeleton. The colour of his face is completely changed, but this cannot altogether be attributed to his slight beard. The latter only hides the appalling sunken cheeks. I cannot understand how any human nature, the English being Protestant, and of course are not Christians, can keep them in this condition. Behind my prison blinded bars, I do possess what none can take away. Oscar described the incident when I was brought down from the prison to the court of bankruptcy between two policemen. Robbie waited in the long, dreary corridor, that before the whole crowd, whom an action so sweet and simple hushed into silence. He might gravely raise his hat to me as handcuffed and with bowed head pass by him. Men have gone to heaven for smaller things than that. It was with this spirit and with this mode of love that the saints knelt down to wash the feet of the poor or stopped to kiss the leper on the cheek. This was an act not just of Christian compassion but of bravery. Robbie Ross really was Robbie, Rob Oscar's true and devoted friend and his ashes were later placed in Oscar's tomb in 1950 as Robbie had always wished. Now, I am completely penniless and absolutely homeless. Yet there are worse things in the world than that. I am quite candid when I say that rather than go out from this prison with bitterness in my heart against the world, I would gladly and readily beg my bread from door to door. If I got nothing from the house of the rich, I would get something at the house of the poor. Those who have much are often greedy. Those who have little always share. Where I walk, there are thorns. The only difference between the saint and the sinner is that every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Good looks are a snare that every man would like to be caught in. What is a sinner? A man who knows the price of everything and the value of life.